Dear church family, we gather tonight to remember what God has done in ages past in the 16th century Reformation, and it's uh, being brought to even greater fruition in the 17th, but also to apply to ourselves some of the great truths of the Reformation. Tonight we're going to focus just on one of them. But maybe the question you have from the outset is, what really initiated the Reformation? We say, of course, it's God's work and it's the Holy Spirit that did it. That's obvious. But there were three things the Spirit used, three major things. The first is the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church itself. The church was in crisis. Popes were leading godless, corrupt lives, abusing their power. Priests were supposed to be celibate, but they almost all had concubines and illegitimate children on the side who they then supported through confiscated church funds. Worship services were conducted in Latin that no one understood. Education was improving, and people were beginning to understand some things weren't right in the Roman Catholic Church. And so more and more people started to question the Pope's claim that he was Christ's representative here on earth. And then it was discovered that the documents used to justify the claims that the Pope was the vicar of Christ had been forged, and that the Bible gave no support to them or to many other Roman Catholic teachings. The second thing was that the Holy Spirit began to work in people a desire, much like in our day, all around the world today, as you you know I trust, there is a longing for people to be, they want to be closer to God. They want to find real meaning in life. And that was true in the 16th century as well. People were tired of the formalistic, hypocritical rituals of the church. And they wanted to know, how can I relate to God? How can I experience salvation? And they were particularly worried about what would happen to them when they died. Because they had no real relationship with God. One of the major differences until today between Roman Catholicism as a whole and Protestantism as a whole, of course, varies from individual to individual, is that the focus in Roman Catholicism is on the externals of worship and the externals of religion. And you look to the church for everything. You depend on the church. And there's so many people you have to go through, mediators you have to go through to get to God, there's not much of a real relationship with God. I'm not saying there's no exceptions, but in Protestantism, you see, there's a direct relationship to God through the mediator Jesus, and we don't have ministers as priests, or Mary is not a go-between between God and us or other saints. It's directly to God. And it's internal relationship preeminently between God and us. And you see, that's what the people were missing. And the church responded to this need already in the 12th century by inventing a doctrine called purgatory, which was a way of comforting people who felt that heaven was beyond their reach. And they said, in purgatory, God will give you a second chance to work off your sins. And eventually you... You might become good enough to go to heaven. Particularly if you buy indulgences in this life, this is now moving into the 15th century, you can pay off your sins so that when you get to purgatory, you can quite quickly move to heaven. Well, this became a popular form of fundraising for the church, but with Martin Luther and others just before him and after him, people began to see through this charade, and they were disillusioned. It became a man-centered enterprise 
And they recognized it as such, and they despised it. And then the third thing is that there were a number of people in 14th, 15th, 16th century, some of the forerunners of the Reformation also, who really went back and studied. It's called ad fontes, back to the sources, back to the original language. They studied the Greek and the Hebrew, and, and they really searched the Scriptures, and they began to understand that many of the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church were just made up by papal authority throughout the ages because of the doctrine that the Pope has as much authority as the Bible when he speaks ex cathedra from his papal, papal chair formal pronouncements. And they began to see that this doctrine is nowhere in the Bible. The Pope does not have this authority. And they began to see that so many things the Pope said contradicted what the Scripture said. And so there was this cry going out already among the forerunners, sola scriptura, let us go back to the Scriptures. And that, of course, in the 16th century, spilling over into the 17th, brought us this tremendous reformation by the grace of the Holy Spirit with all these biblical doctrines gleaned directly from the Bible and the precious confessions and catechisms we have always grounded solidly in the Scriptures. And then the idea that not only are we saved by grace alone, justification through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, based on the Word alone, but the idea then was we've got to reform all of worship. And we've got to do our worship exactly the way the New Testament church did her worship. And that revolutionized everything. And the Reformation was born. Now, one of the major doctrines of the Reformation, you know the Canons of Dort, it's kind of a summary of the salvific doctrines of the Reformation. Uh, and, and later on, the word tulip was developed as a monomic device to express that total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And in past years, we've looked at several of these, but we've never looked at the last one, perseverance of the saints. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to look at that with you through God's work in the life of one of the, uh, well, the most famous Puritan who was solidly reformed, uh, John Bunyan. Bunyan was a powerful preacher and the best known of all Puritan writers, particularly through his Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan had an incredible way of reaching the common man. And I call it participatory preaching. He, he so graphically portrayed his text that he, he brought his people right into the text. And he reached them in such a beautiful way that John Owen, the, the greatest theologian among the Puritans, once said, I would gladly exchange all my learning for Bunyan's power of touching men's hearts. But Bunyan, as I'll show you tonight, was no one-title wonder. He wasn't just the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He, he wrote more than 60 books in his 60 years of life, many of which have continued to feed the souls of thousands of men and women even until today. Well, one of Bunyan's strongest doctrines was the perseverance of the saints. He lived out that perseverance in his own life, and he believed in that doctrine to the depths of his soul, despite all the suffering that he had to endure. Or I might say, because of all the suffering he had to endure, he learned that the only way to live was to persevere in the most holy faith out of the persevering and preserving grace of God coming to the believer. And so Bunyan wrote this, To be saved is to be preserved in the faith to the end. He that in, shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He's quoting now Matthew 24, 13, which is our text for tonight. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He says, not that perseverance is an accident in Christianity, 
or a thing merely performed by human industry. No, they that are saved are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. But perseverance is absolutely necessary to the complete saving of the soul to the end. He that goes to sea with a purpose to arrive in Spain cannot arrive there if he's drowned by the way. Wherefore, perseverance is an absolutely necessary grace to the saving of the soul. So, what I want to do with you tonight is I want to look first with you at this doctrine of perseverance as a Reformed Puritan biblical doctrine. And then I want to show you, taking you through Bunyan's life, I want to, I want to cut up his life, as it were, into seven chunks and apply each chunk in, in some relationship to this doctrine of perseverance. So our text then is, but he that shall endure unto the end, Matthew 24, 13, the same shall be saved. And my title is Perseverance Through Suffering, Lessons by God's Grace from John Bunyan. Now, in Matthew 24, this text jumps out at us, doesn't it? It's so powerful. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This text actually is set in the context of Matthew 24, where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the end times of the world and the fall of Jerusalem as well. And throughout this chapter, there's references to both, and some overlap and some are identical. And the implication of all that is also in our own individual lives. You see, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. So really, shall be saved here is referring to temporal salvation, deliverance from some great infirmity like the fall of Jerusalem, or some great Red Sea in front of you as we heard a few weeks ago. But it also applies, and ultimately applies, to everlasting salvation, persevering to the very end of our lives in the grace of God. So what really is the doctrine of perseverance of the saints, that is, the perseverance of God's people? Well, that doctrine teaches us that all who partake, all who partake of saving grace in the power of saving union with Christ by faith will continue in that union and have communion with Christ that flows out of that union with all of its benefits and fruits to the end of their lives and therefore ultimately to all eternity. So the Reformers and Puritans embedded this doctrine, however, like all others, entirely in God's grace. And so what they're teaching is this. By the preserving work of the triune God, believers will and do persevere in true faith and in good works that proceed from faith so long as they continue in this world. And so if you are regenerate, you're sitting here tonight, you're, you're regenerate, you're justified, you're adopted into God's family, you're being sanctified, you cannot lose that salvation, 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says. Because God will keep you forever, Jude says. For your perseverance is the fruit of His preservation of you. That's important. If your perseverance depended on your perseverance you'd fail miserably. But if your perseverance depends on the preservation of God in you and over you, you see, then it's secure forever. So if you have truly confessed your faith in Christ alone with all your heart, sin will not have dominion over you, Romans 6.14 says, neither, and this is the language of our Westminster Confession of Faith, neither can you totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace. 
chapter 17, paragraph 1. Now, this does not mean that believers are immune to sin or that they can never fail to exercise saving grace. Though their faith won't altogether die, there are times, sadly, when it will not be active, times when they backslide, stumble into sin. You see, apart from a continuous influx of Christ into our souls, of His preserving grace, by His Spirit, we cannot continue or flourish in grace. But we'll, we'll go the wrong way. Without Jesus, we can do nothing, John 15 says. You see, God alone gives the increase, for He never forsakes the work of His own hands. And so, when we speak of perseverance, we're not claiming perfectionism, we're not claiming freedom from sin, but we are saying that all the elect brought into holy, vital union with Christ Himself will be supplied by grace from Christ Himself all the way to the end of their lives. Because Christ is the life of our life, and He's the strength of our strength. It's all because of Christ. And furthermore, the Holy Spirit, having indwelling power and presence in the hearts of the elect as His dwelling place, never leaves them. Never leaves them. He promotes their sanctification until He has made their souls right for entrance into heaven. And so ultimately, it's the whole triune God, the decreeing Father, the persevering and intercessory keeping Son, and the indwelling sanctifying Spirit that work out this perseverance of the saints unto the end of their lives. So in a nutshell, the faithful covenant-keeping God keeps alive in the hearts of His elect the spark of holy faith and holy love, which he himself has kindled, despite all their waywardness, all their slothfulness, and even their disobedience. I want to show you how this doctrine is true in the life of John Bunyan and apply it, with God's help tonight, to your soul. Section number one in Bunyan's life, the young John Bunyan, a rebellious blasphemer and a convicted sinner. Bunyan was born in 1628, Elstow, near Bedford, to Thomas Bunyan and Margaret Bentley. Thomas Bunyan was a tinker, not altogether poor, but, but somewhat so. Maybe you'd say lower, middle class. Bunyan was not highly educated. His dad couldn't afford it. As he grew up, he became rebellious, lived for pleasure, frequently indulged in cursing. And he himself said, from a child, I had few equals in terms of cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. Sporadic convictions of sin through the common operations of the Holy Spirit penetrated his heart from time to time. But not enough Enough maybe to restrain a little bit of sin or a lot of sin, but not enough to cure him of these sinful habits. Then when Bunyan was 16, his mother and sister both died within one month of each other. And his dad soon remarried a woman that Bunyan couldn't get along with. So Bunyan tried to escape by joining Oliver Cromwell's new model army. But there in the army, he continued his rebellious ways. Fighting in the Civil War, however, sobered him. On one occasion, his life was incredibly, wonderfully spared. A soldier came to him one night and said, Hey, Bunyan, I've got something to do tomorrow night. I know you're on guard duty tonight. How about if I take your place? You take it for me tomorrow. 
Bunyan says, whatever, no problem. Well, that soldier got killed that night on guard duty. And Bunyan knew the next morning that would have been me, apart from the amazing grace of God. He was discharged from the army, 1647. His military experience he later incorporated into his great classic, The Holy War. Talking about it from a spiritual perspective, the holy war going on in the state of man's soul was an outgrowth of Bunyan's own experience in, in the army, as well as, his, of course, his spiritual experience. He returned to his father's trade as a tinker. Uh, that's a metal worker. He would carry tools, a 60-pound portable anvil on his back from farm to farm to find work. One year out of the army, Bunyan married a God-fearing woman. We don't know her name. We do know that she had two books, both Puritan books, Arthur Dent's The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven and Lewis Bailey's The Practice of Piety, both, of, both books that we've reprinted in the last 20 years or so. And when Bunyan read these two books, he was more convicted of his sin than ever before. He started attending the parish church, stopped swearing, gave up sports, especially sports on Sunday, and gave up his dancing. But he wasn't still saved. But after some months, he was walking by a group of women who were talking about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ and talking about how they loved him and what Jesus meant for them. And Bunyan found his soul just strangely warmed on the one hand, but convicted on the other, and jealous on the other. He said, I, I don't have that. I don't have that. I, I, need, I need what these women have. And that brought him into very deep conviction of sin. He said to the Lord at this time, Lord, I've got the worst heart in all of London. Could I, could I please become an animal? I wouldn't have to have a soul to give an account to thee. He felt, when he read 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying, worthy to be accepted of all, that Christ Jesus came into the world to seek and to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Bunyan said, no, Paul, you're not chief. You didn't know John Bunyan yet. I'm chief. God was emptying Bunyan of himself. Have you ever been there? So lesson number one, perseverance demands regeneration and faith in Christ, not mere conviction of sin. Conviction of sin won't bring you to heaven. At this stage of his life, Bunyan stopped swearing, he was going to church, he was under conviction. No doubt a lot of people would have thought he was saved, but he, he didn't know Jesus. He didn't understand experientially this is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. His conscience was active, and that's a good thing, of course. His conduct was clean. His church attendance was now regular. He was even reading good books. But you see, a man can fall away from all those things and not persevere. You can go through stages in your life. If you grow up, boys and girls, in the church, often... Children will go through those stages too where you're serious for a while, then it just kind of falls away. There's no promise of preservation to those who are not yet born again. It's only when God works regeneration, conversion in the soul, you see, begins that good work of grace that we can confess with Paul that we are confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So the new birth, regeneration, is the foundation, experiential foundation, of perseverance. Objectively, of course, Christ is the all in, in all. Chunk number two, Bunyan's conversion and justification. These same godly women that Bunyan overheard talking introduced him to John Gifford, their pastor in Bedford in 1651. 
And Bunyan began to attend that preaching, which was a warm, reformed, experiential kind of preaching that addressed the whole man. The same kind of preaching that we strive to bring you in this church today. And God used Gifford to lead Bunyan to genuine repentance and faith. Bunyan was particularly influenced by a sermon that Gifford preached on Song of Solomon 4 verse 1, Behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair. And then he also read Luther's commentary on Galatians, which had a profound effect. For the first time in his life, he understood the idea of justification by faith alone without works. Bunyan said after he read the book, it was written out of my own heart. The time was ripe for Bunyan to experience deliverance. And it happened soon after that. He's walking in a field, and he wrote about this unforgettable experience he had. I was passing in this field, and this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is not in thee, but it's in heaven. And methought, I saw with the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ at God's right hand is my righteousness. I was immediately loosed from all my afflictions and irons. My temptations fled away. I went home rejoicing for the grace and the love of God. For Jesus Christ was made my righteousness, the same yesterday and today and forever. All my chains did fall off of my legs. You see, his heart was captured by the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And he lived out of that for some time. Bunyan says, I live for some time very sweetly at peace with God through Christ. Oh, me thought, Christ, Christ, there was nothing but Christ that was before my eyes. I was not now only looking upon this or that particular benefit of Christ, his blood, his burial, his resurrection. No, I saw him. I considered him as the whole Christ. And it was glorious to me to see him in his exaltation and all his benefits. I could look for myself to him. I could reckon that all the graces of God in Christ were now given to me. I felt that Christ was like my gold in my trunk at home. In Christ, my Lord, my Savior, He is all. Well, lesson number two. Perseverance is grounded on Christ's righteousness. Not our own. Not our own. You see, our status with God is grounded 100% on Christ's merits. His passive, His active obedience That's why Paul could say, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. And so Bunyan said, I could now not believe that I was not united with Christ. For I was. God's grace imputed him to me. His covenant stands forever. And I am in that covenant of mercy, that covenant of grace. So you see, without the unchangeability of God's covenant promise, sealed with the blood of Christ, the perfection of Christ's righteousness, well, without that, it could could fall, it could perish. But Bunyan knew that because of the unchangeability of God's covenant promise, because of the sealing power of Christ's blood, because of the perfection of Christ's righteousness, you see, any Christian who's in Christ will persevere to the end. Section 3 of Bunyan's life, his first steps as a preacher and a writer. The year 1654 was momentous for Bunyan. He moved to Bedford with his wife and four children, all under the age of six, one of whom, his firstborn Mary, was blind from birth. And that same year, he became a member of Gifford's church and then was appointed deacon a year later. And his testimony became the talk of the town, actually. It helped lead other people also to conversion. But by the end of one year of being a member in Gifford's church, Gifford died. And the deacons asked Bunyan to begin preaching, which he did. 
that very next year to various congregations in and around Bedford. And hundreds of people came to hear him. He started preaching outdoors. And close to a thousand or more people would come to hear him. About that same time, without, without seminary training, by the way, he's probably just about the only Puritan out of hundreds of Puritans that didn't have seminary training, he published his first book, Some Gospel Truths Opened, against the Quakers. And a couple years later, published a very famous book, A Few Sighs from Hell, warning the unsaved about the story about the rich man. And this book is attacking the professional clergy and the wealthy people who promote carnality. Well, after a couple years of preaching and a few books, Bunyan's first wife suddenly dies, leaving him four children. And uh, it's a tumultuous time in his life, but he can't stop preaching. And then he meets a woman named Elizabeth, and he, uh, he knows he needs a wife desperately, and he marries her very quickly. And uh, just after they get married, she gets pregnant with a child, and then Bunyan gets arrested, arrested for preaching under the terms of the newly revived Act of Uniformity, which required all services to be held inside buildings of the Church of England. The judge and jailer first felt quite sorry for Bunyan. He's got four little children at home. His wife is pregnant. And they just said to him, why don't you just agree? Just, just tell us verbally you won't, you won't preach and we'll let you go. But Bunyan said, if you let me go today, I'll be preaching tomorrow. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. So he's thrown into prison. And he stayed in prison longer than any other Puritan for 12 and a half years, making shoelaces and writing books. Writing books brought no income. Shoelaces got a few pennies into the home to help support his needy family. Lesson number three. Perseverance involves a willingness to suffer for Christ. See, Bunyan was living this text out right now. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. In fact, Bunyan writes in one of his books about this text, and he says the word endure means to go to the distance, to go to the finish line, despite any hardships that come along the way. And then he says these remarkable words. It's an easy matter for a man to run hard for a little spurt, maybe even for a mile or two. Oh, but to hold out for a hundred miles, for a thousand miles, for ten thousand miles. That man who does this, he, will, he must look to meet with cross and pain and wearisomeness to the flesh, especially if, as he goes, he meets with briars and quagmires and other encumbrances that make his journey so much the more painful." Bunyan speaking from his own experience here. You know, in Pilgrim's Progress, not the Christiana part, that's the typical conversion of his church, average church member. The, the Christian part in Pilgrim's Progress, that's Bunyan's conversion. He's, he's letting you know there autobiographically how the Lord led him. And and when you read Christians' experiences, they're full of trials, aren't they? In the form of crosses to be born, dangers to be faced. And yet, Christian makes it all the way, perseveres all the way to the end. So, Bunyan is saying to us, through his life, through his writings, don't ever give up on the Lord. Don't ever let the Lord alone. No matter what he leads you through, no matter how you are to suffer, persevere. Keep going. Keep running the race, looking to Jesus. Section number four, Bunyan's experience of outward injustice and inward pain. Outward injustice and inward pain. Bunyan's new wife, Elizabeth, repeatedly went to the jail, into the court, to plead for her husband's release. But the judges would have none of it. Her boldness was a wonder to many. She was only 19 or 20 years old. 
at the time and, and very pregnant. But when it became real that her husband wasn't coming back, she went into premature labor and lost the baby. And yet she went back to her husband's accusers with courage. One notable interview she had with them, she said to the justice, will you please, please let my husband go? He's got a blind daughter at home that needs him. We all need him. And the justice said, he's just a pestilent fellow. The other judge said, will your husband leave off preaching? If you will do so, send for him. We will let him go. Elizabeth said, my Lord, he dares not leave off preaching as long as he can speak. His accusers then said, he's a breaker of the peace. As Elizabeth responded, no, sirs, my husband only wants to live peacefully, pursue his calling, provide for his family of four small children. Then one of the justices said, well, what is your husband's calling anyway? She said, a tinker, mending pots and pans. The other justice said, no, he will preach and he will do whatever he wants. Elizabeth said, oh, sir, he preaches nothing but the word of God. At that point, the other judge became so angry that Elizabeth feared he would hit her. He said, but he preaches the doctrine of the devils. And she replied gently, my Lord, when the righteous judge shall appear, it will be known that his doctrine is not the doctrine of the devil. One of John Bunyan's biographers, John Brown, said this, Elizabeth Bunyan was simply an English peasant woman. Could she have spoken with more dignity had she been a crowned queen? And so Bunyan remained in jail for 12 years without any formal charge, without any legal sentence, which was against the law, simply because he refused to stop preaching. In 1661, for about a year, and then again in 1668 through 1672, for four more years, the jailers came to have so much respect for Bunyan that they would let him go out and preach at night. And they would often send people, the, the, the government would often send people to check to make sure Bunyan was there. And if, if Bunyan were gone, the jailer would lose his job immediately. But these two jailers were Christians, and they trusted that God would protect Bunyan when he was gone, and that the, they would not come. They would not come when he was gone. In fact, one jailer even said to Bunyan, I know my God will protect both you and me. And in those five years, Bunyan would preach late at night in different places, out in the woods, in barns, and never got caught. It was remarkable. In fact, one biographer puts it this way, there are, there's a many of a Baptist congregation in Bedfordshire County that owes its origins to John Bunyan's midnight preaching in those years. But those prison, prison years were not easy for Bunyan. He experienced in those years what Christian and faithful experienced in the great dungeon of giant despair where they had the dark night of the soul Giant despair thrusting them into a very dark dungeon, nasty and stinking. Well, that was Bunyan in the prison. Bunyan said he felt a separation from his wife and children so acutely, including dear blind Mary, that it was as if someone was regularly pulling the flesh off of his bones. The pain was so great. Lesson number four. Perseverance does not preclude times of doubt and depression. We must not be foolishly optimistic about the lives of God's people. They do not walk in unbroken sunshine. Bunyan once said this, Once when I was in prison, I was above all the rest in a very sad and low condition for many weeks of the dark night of the soul, sometimes for weeks at a time. For indeed at that time, all the things of God, all the things of God were hid from my soul. I 
And sometimes, in those times, the thought of death by execution would come into his dreams and obsess him. The devil would torment him. How do you know for sure you're going to heaven? How do you know for sure you're not wrong? And then the next breath, oh, my children will become destitute beggars. What will happen to my blind Mary? But Bunyan said through it all, he learned, Hebrews eleven twenty seven. 27, to live upon that God who is invisible. To live by faith in the dark night of the soul. See, perseverance is tested. It was for Paul too, wasn't it? We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, 2 Corinthians 1. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in that God which raiseth from the dead. That's it. God perseveres. And we persevere. Even in the dark night of the soul. Now Bunyan pictures this in a powerful way, in a powerful way, in Pilgrim's Progress. You remember the story where there is a man that uh, poured water on a fire, showing how the devil tries to extinguish the work of grace that God produces in the heart. But the fire kept burning. In fact, the fire grew hotter. And Bunyan asks, how could this be? And then he says, ah, but hidden behind the wall, hidden behind the wall, the pilgrim saw another man pouring oil on the fire. Which Bunyan says, shows how Christ sustains grace in the heart of a believer by his Holy Spirit. Symbolic of the oil. And Bunyan says, the reason the man remained hidden was to show that it is hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. In the darkness of depression, we sometimes cannot sense God's presence. But He's there. And He's pouring oil. And He's keeping us. He's working with His Holy Spirit. Promising, never, no, never, no, never, Hebrews 13, 5, to forsake you. Now that image of the fire by the wall is classic Reformed Puritan biblical theology. In those 200 words of this illustration, Bunyan captures the whole doctrine of perseverance so beautifully. Perseverance, you see, does not mean that we march triumphantly through life like heroes in a victory parade, as the health and wealth gospel people say it today. But it means, rather, that we battle our way through temptations and trials and sometimes deep discouragements, all the while discovering the grace of God's promise to us in Jesus Christ. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That's what grows perseverance more than ever. Section number five. Bunyan's productivity behind bars. Bunyan's prison years were difficult, but they were amazingly productive. He wrote 40 books in prison. 12 years. With a Bible and Fox's Book of Martyrs. That's it. No library, no computer, no internet. Just Bunyan, the Holy Spirit, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and the Bible. And he kept writing. He said later that it was the writing, it was the searching of the Scriptures that helped him persevere. He wrote Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, his own life story. He finished A Confession of My Faith, A Reason for My Practice. He wrote his book on justification, all kinds of books in those years in prison. Lesson number five. Perseverance requires being active in the service of the Lord. Active in the service of the Lord. You see, 
when you are active in the service of the Lord, you not only benefit others, but you yourself in some strange way are the greatest beneficiary yourself because you grow in grace yourself. And the discipline of work helps you endure even in harsh surroundings. And so in God's amazing providence, Bunyan is holed up in jail for 12 years so he can write all these books that have benefited tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a 200 and some languages around the globe ever since. That's amazing. <laughs> he never would have dreamed of that. You see, God often brings a connection between perseverance and 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, persevering, even through hardship, doesn't mean giving up and just doing nothing. It means persevering also in the work of the Lord, even in difficult times. Daniel 11 tells us the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And Bunyan was convinced of that. He wrote this, Slothfulness is usually accompanied with carelessness. Carelessness is for the most part begotten by senselessness. And senselessness doth again put fresh strength into slothfulness. And by this means the soul is left without all remedies. What a lesson for us. When you're down and discouraged, sometimes the best thing you can do is, is, is go out and evangelize someone or go out and speak to someone about the Lord. Be active for the Lord if you would persevere. Number six, Bunyan out of jail and back in again. Well, when the Bedford congregation sensed that the magistrates were lessening their resistance to Puritan preaching. All the other Puritans were being let out except Bunyan. They assumed Bunyan would soon be let out. And so they called him. They called him as their pastor. And five months later, he was indeed let out. And he said this when he was let out. I have determined the Almighty God be my help and shield, yet to suffer if frail life might continue so long, even till the moss shall grow over my eyebrows rather than violate my faith in principles. Abunyan was the first Puritan to be thrown in jail and the last to be released. He was a martyr in the eyes of many people. And thousands of people would now come to hear him preach. And he enjoyed a few years of freedom. And then he was arrested and put back in the town jail again, where he continued writing books. It's where he wrote the second jail time was when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which sold more than 100,000 copies during his first 10 years in print. He almost threw it on the fire. He said to his friends, what do you think of this book? They said, ah, it's too imaginative. Well, should I just throw it on the fire? Some of them said, yeah. Well, he said, ah, I'll just try it. I'll try it with a printer and see what the Lord will do. <laughs> and outside of perhaps Thomas Akempis' imitation of Christ, and of course the Bible, it's the best-selling book the world has ever known. You never know what God will use. Lesson number six, perseverance necessitates a pilgrim mindset. A pilgrim mindset. That's what runs through the book of Pilgrim's Progress, isn't it? They're pilgrims, pilgrims, traveling through Vanity Fair all year long. They get beat up in Vanity Fair, but they remain faithful. The people at Vanity Fair get angry at them, but they say, we buy the truth. It actually caused a riot. It led to the arrest of Christian and his friend. See, this is all Bunyan getting arrested. But don't abandon faith, Bunyan says. Persevere. Persevere. Don't abandon faith out of love for the world, as did Demas, he writes. Number seven, Bunyan's final days. John Owen appealed to a bishop in London on behalf of Bunyan in his second imprisonment and persuaded the bishop to release him in 1677. So Bunyan's last decade of his life was prison free. He spent his last years preaching 
an itinerant way to the nonconformists all over the London area and wrote more books. The Greatness of the Soul, The Second Part of Pilgrim's Progress, The Final Three Years of His Life, The Pharisee and the Publican, The Jerusalem Sinner Saved. What a great book that is. The Work of Jesus Christ as an Advocate, another masterpiece. And Christ the Acceptable Sacrifice. In 1688, Bunyan is riding home from preaching in cold weather. He catches a cold, then a fever, and then comes on his deathbed. He's 60 years old, just turned 60. His friends gather around him. He says, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. I go to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will no doubt through the mediation of his blessed Son receive me, though a sinner, where I hope before long we shall all meet to sing the new song and remain everlastingly happy, world without end. And friend after friend came by. He just talked that way to them. The wonders of God's grace filled his mouth. And finally, the very last moments of his life, he said to his friends, my greatest desire is to be with Christ. And then he paused for a moment. And he raised his hands to heaven. And he said, take me, Lord. For I come to thee. And he fell back on his pillow and died. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He was buried in London's Bunhill Fields Cemetery, close to many other Puritans like Thomas Goodwin and John Owen. Lesson number seven, perseverance is driven by the hope of glory. See, in dark times, whether we're in prison, on a sick bed, or a death's door, God's word, God's son, God's promise, God's grace still remains our hope. Really, ultimately, it's the hope of glory. It's that a Christian has a future. One of John Bunyan's favorite texts in all the Bible were these words, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Hope of glory. Doesn't that make you want to persevere? The best is yet to come. I was going for a walk with my wife today, and I just looked at her and I said, can you imagine what it will be to be standing together around the throne of the Lamb, just praising the Lamb forever? Run the race. Run the race set before you, laying aside every sin, looking to Jesus. The hope of glory is not just a goal of perseverance. It's its daily bread and butter. If you want to persevere in this race, as I trust you do, feed your soul with a view of the one who's seated at God's right hand. And, and picture those in your mind who are gathered around him in shining garments. Remember, the best is yet to come. One Lord's Day when John Bunyan was in jail, he was supposed to preach to his fellow prisoners, but he said, I found myself so empty and spiritless and barren, he didn't think he could do it. And then at the last moment, he was looking through his Bible, and he came upon the description of the heavenly Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation. He was so dazzled by the splendor of God among his heavenly people that he went straight into preaching. And then he turned the sermon into a book called the Holy City, New Jerusalem. Hope of glory. That will make you persevere. So in conclusion, John Bunyan's life exemplified what his doctrine teaches. Perseverance is a battle. Perseverance goes through suffering, but it's a battle already won by Christ on the cross he persevered to the end. And our perseverance rests in him. And so take courage, dear pilgrim. 
and press on in the way, trusting in God, looking to Christ, praying in the Spirit, and hoping for glory. Always remembering, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. Gracious God, we thank Thee so much for this wonderful doctrine of perseverance taught by our forefathers, grounded in the Scriptures, and lived in their lives. We thank Thee in a special way for the perseverance of John Bunyan and for, thou, for, thou, for how Thou hast used him. Lord, we know that none of us will be John Bunyan's, but let him be a mentor for us to stir us up so that whatever gifts we do have, that we may use them faithfully in thy service, and that the day may come when by thy grace we may enter into the hope of glory and hear thee say to us, even if we're just tinkers, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Oh, make us, Lord, such sons and daughters of the Reformation who persevere by faith in Jesus Christ all the way to the end. Keep the feet of thy saints that they slip not. Keep our feet, Lord. Keep our hearts. Keep our minds. Keep us in the, in the footsteps of the flock looking to Jesus evermore. In Jesus' name, amen.